What's going on everyone? My name is Spidey and I'm an award-winning mentalist and certified hypnotist with a degree in social psychology. And I teach people all over the world how to use persuasion in sales, negotiations, and everyday life. A couple of weeks ago, Netflix released an original series called Lupin and it is an amazing series. It's based on a fictional con man from French literature named Arsène Lupin. And this series is about a character who's inspired by that character and there are such great moments of persuasion here and in this video i'm going to look at those moments and tell you how likely they are to work in the real world i'm not going to look at any of the physical cons just the ones where he convinces people or uses persuasion now if you don't watch the show you absolutely should because it's amazing but don't worry about it because i'm going to show you a couple of clips that I selected and I'm going to tell you how likely they are to work in the real world and why they would work or why they wouldn't work. So let's start with this one. Don't move or I'll shoot. Okay. You win. I give up. Stay back. Just wanted to say, your safety's still on. I'll take it off. Keep the thing pointed at me. It's fine. A man? Easy, look. It's off now. Okay. What the shit? So a whole security team is trying to catch the main character, Asan, and one of them finally gets him, holds him up at gunpoint, and that is the script that he uses to get out of it. So let's break it down and look at the different persuasion techniques that he used. The first one is incongruity. In his book, Split Second Persuasion, the author, Kevin Dutton, talks about incongruity as one of the pillars of persuasion. Basically, whenever your brain sees or hears something that is inconsistent, it slows down to try to make sense of it. Now, before I tell you how this was used, I wanna prove it to you. In a moment, I'm gonna put some words up on the screen and I want you to look at them in order and out loud, actually do this out loud, name the color of the font that you're seeing. So don't read the word, name the color that the writing is in. For example, if you saw this, you would say red, not green. So here we go. Try to do this as fast as you can. Three, two, one, go. Now we're gonna try it again. Remember, you're naming the color of the font, the writing, not the word that's written down. Here we go, try it again as fast as you can in three, two, one, go. The results on that second one were probably very different for most of you, especially those of you who speak English as a first language. This is called the Stroop effect. Basically, because your eyes are seeing an inconsistency between the color of the font and the color that's written down, it slows down to try to figure out what's going on, even if the task is very clear. But let me know in the comments how you did with that. I'm actually really curious. Did you just stall a little bit or were you absolutely stuck at certain points? Do you think you may have gotten a few of them wrong? Research has actually shown that people with higher intelligence do really bad with this and get stuck really hard because their reflex is to read things as opposed to just look at colors. Now let's go back to Lupin and see how he used this. So he got caught, the guy's holding a gun at him, and normally you would expect someone who's got a gun pointed at them even physically and vocally to panic and be like, oh my God, okay, I'll co you know, sort of go to that panic mode, but he does the opposite. His face is calm, his demeanor is calm, he moves very slow, and he speaks with a very soft tone. And he offers to help the guy. Now, that is not only incongruent, but he's also establishing authority. It's been researched again and again, and I'm sure you guys intuitively understand that when we see someone as a figure of authority, it's more likely that we are going to follow what they say. The most famous study on the subject was the Milgram study, but it's been researched thoroughly. And he says, your safety is on, I'm gonna come turn it off. Keep that thing pointed at me. Notice how he's establishing himself as the authority figure here, and he's controlling the frame. And he uses that to get close, turn the safety off, 
and run away. Of course, it was all a con. He was actually turning the safety on. So it is a wonderful script. It's beautifully written, but would it work in the real world? Well, I think it would have to depend 100% on the security guard and how much training or experience he has. If he's a very experienced security guard who's used to working under pressure, he would have shot him in the legs or something, or he would have said, I'm not kidding, stay where you are, get on your knees. He would have taken control of the situation a lot more effectively. But if he's new at the job, he's a little nervous, he's stressed, he knows the reputation of the con man, I think it could have worked. Now, once again, I'm only commenting on the persuasion element of these clips. I am by no means an expert on law enforcement or firearms. So if we have anybody watching this who is an expert on those things, please, please let us know in the comments, is there anything about the security guard that allows you to know how experienced he is? Maybe the type of firearm he's using, maybe the way he's holding it, something about his demeanor. I don't know. Let us know in the comments because I'd love to know that because it plays a huge part in this. Assuming that the security guard is neither extremely experienced or extremely new, let's say he's just a typical security guard, I'm going to put the percentage of this working somewhere near 30%, I think. I think that's a good number, just a little bit under a third of the time because yes, it's a good script. Yes, he's using a lot of really strong persuasion, but I think in that situation, the guy with the gun, even if he has just a little bit of experience, is gonna immediately take control and won't let the guy come that close to him. So 30%, I'm comfortable with that. In this next scene, I'm gonna show you guys a very important moment for one of his cons, and I'm gonna ask you guys a question to see who amongst you naturally understands persuasion and how it works. But before we get to that, guys, do me a huge favor, hit that subscribe button, turn those notifications on for more amazing psychology and persuasion. In this elaborate con, Asan wants to steal a very expensive necklace from a museum. He's done all his research, he has a wonderful plan in place, but it all depends on him actually holding the necklace in his hands for a couple of seconds. So to do that, he presents himself to the auction where they are selling the necklace and he even has a whole fake um, Wikipedia page set up about who he's pretending to be that corroborates all the money he makes and he's this rich entrepreneur and he wins the necklace in the auction. Now on the way to go see the necklace, the guy who was running the auction says this. I must admit, Mr. Serene, I wasn't expecting someone like you as a buyer. Like me? What do you mean? Well, I mean, uh, well, so young. <laughs> and here is your necklace. Well, when your money transfer is validated. What well, can I see it now? For that price? Just a little peek. This necklace is my baby now, you get it? Of course. All right. Thank you. It's my pleasure. That is a wonderful little persuasion script. And to tell you why it's so great, we're gonna travel back to about 3400 BC to ancient Greece and the philosopher Aristotle, who was the first person ever who wrote about persuasion. And he said that there are four pillars of persuasion. And in that little scene we just saw, the character used all four. So let's look at them and how they were used. The first pillar of persuasion, according to Aristotle, is persuasion through ethos, which means character, who you are, your credibility. Now, in this case, character is already established. He comes into the auction, he's dressed really nice, they look him up, he's got a lot of accomplishments, he's got a lot of money, and also, this guy knows as a con man how to really portray that confidence. So character is already established. The second pillar of persuasion is Logos, logic, persuading someone through numbers, facts, and reasoning. And right there in the beginning, he says, can I have a look at the necklace? Well, come on, with what I paid for it. So he's appealing to their logic, saying like, with that amount of money that I gave you, I think you could stand to let me take a quick look at it. Aristotle's third method of persuasion is pathos. And look at that word, pathos, sympathy, empathy, pathology. Pathos basically means emotions. If you can get someone to emotionally connect with what you're saying, you're more likely to get something out of them. And in this case, it was the next sentence he said, this necklace is my baby now, you understand? So he's really creating an emotional metaphor for that necklace. It's my baby, I feel for this, 
and getting them to sympathize with how important this necklace is to him. Aristotle's fourth pillar of persuasion is kairos, which means the right time. In other words, there are right times to present something to someone that will give you better odds of getting what you want than other times. And the best example I could give you is it would have been a lot easier for me to sell you disinfectants or any sanitary products in the year 2020 than any other year. So the time matters. And in this case, the timing is perfect because he just won the auction. He hasn't paid for the necklace yet, but he just won it. And he just wants to take a quick look at it because he's excited. Had he showed up to the museum a week before that and said, I have the intention of bidding on this, it may not have worked as well. I think this has a really, really high chance of working in the real world. I'm gonna go ahead and put it right at 95% because it's almost perfect. Yes, there's a 5% chance that you have someone who really wants to stick to protocol and say, no, that's strictly forbidden, but I think this would work very much most of the time. But now I wanna hear from you guys. I wanna see who amongst you naturally understands how persuasion works. On the way in, the auctioneer said to him, I didn't expect someone like you to win the necklace. And he said, what do you mean someone like me? And he created this little moment of awkwardness and confrontation. Let me know in the comments why you think he did that. What was he talking about and why did he choose to bring it up? Let me know what you think. I wanna know which of you understands the reason of him doing that. And in the next video on this topic, I will answer the question. In this next epic scene, our con man needs to get information from a police officer. Now there's a bit of context here that's pretty important. In a previous episode, he already proved to this policeman that he had cameras all over his house, he has information about his family, and he even hacked a little smart speaker in his house that the policeman completely destroyed in a moment of frustration. And now he goes up to him in a restaurant to get that information, and here's what happens. Where's your wife, Gabriel? At work. No. She's not there. You leave my family out of this? She should be at work right she now. She has nothing to do with this. Tell me about Pellegrini. You got a choice? You want to take down Pellegrini? There's a woman named Fabienne Berrio who can help you. A journalist. A few years ago, she almost got him. I didn't tell you. See you to say I love you. Now before the breakdown, I wanna say this. This scene is a lot more manipulation and a lot less persuasion. I don't like manipulation at all. With manipulation, usually one of the two sides is either stressed or threatened or scared or loses. With persuasion, that's not the case. Persuasion is a more effective way of communicating, but there's never any losers. That being said, there's still some great psychology in this scene, so let's dive right in. The first thing we have to look at is context. In this case, the context is so important. One of my favorite books on persuasion is called Persuasion by Robert Cialdini, who is one of the global authorities on the subject of influence and persuasion. And by the way, all the books I'm recommending, I will leave links in the description to where you guys get these delivered right to your door. This is a great one. And in here, he talks about the context of persuasion before you even persuade. And one of the things he says is how anything that's threatening gets our attention. And that's when we start going more into words manipulation. So it's not something I recommend, but it does explain what's happening in this scene. He used a threat, and it wasn't even a real threat. He didn't have the wife, but he used a perceived threat, like we have your wife, she's not at work, very confidently 
to get the guy to comply and give him what he wants. The second thing, I really kind of like this, is that speaker with the little bow on it. In fact, when he gives it to him, he says, um, you broke yours recently. There's a bit of a joke there, like he's kind of mocking him, but there's also almost a peace offering saying like, help me out. And he's enacting one of the pillars of persuasion, which is reciprocity. I give you something, you give me information. I know there's some irony there, but it's still on a subconscious level, a bit of a peace offering. Third, we have something that we call in psychology, pacing and leading. Pacing and leading basically means that if I present something to you that is true, and try to persuade you after that, I can get the ball rolling. And in this case, simply, the officer already knows that he had cameras in his house, he hacked his little smart speaker, and then he just gave this suggestion of, I have your wife. If he just walked in randomly, some guy on the street said, we have your wife, he would arrest the person, call the wife, and be like, everything is good. But in this case, he's already set that pace, and so the cop believes that he has access and that he would go to great lengths to sabotage this man. So here the persuasion is, would he be able to convince him that he's got his wife and get that information out of him? And given the context, given the perceived threat, the reciprocity, that pace and lead to really convince him that he can really get deep into his life. Yeah, I'm gonna give this really good odds. I'm gonna go with 80, 85% that this would work somewhere in that range. Let's lock in 82.5% that given that context, this would work and he would give him the information. There it was guys. I hope you enjoyed this breakdown of persuasion scripts from the amazing series Lupin. I hope you guys check out the show. Let me know in the comments, are you watching the show? What do you think of it? And let me know what you thought of these breakdowns. Would love your feedback, would love your thoughts. Thanks so much for watching guys. I will see you on the next one.